Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So, um, hello to everybody and thank you for joining our webinar today. It's great to have so many people interested to hear about Enabled First and Human and how it can accelerate programs into clinic and through to proof of concept. The goal of today's presentation is to provide an introduction to Enabled First and Human and to illustrate the many different configurations in which it can be applied. I'm pleased to say that also presenting is Dr. Phil Collis from Biocrest. So first of all, a presentation outline. In this presentation today, we will provide a snapshot of the state of the pharmaceutical industry and highlight the drivers for change that we're all experiencing. I will then explain the concept of translational pharmaceutics. With the, with the hope of leaving you with a clear understanding of what it is and how it can help. I'll then hand over to Phil for his presentation on a program of work that Biochrist performed on oral calocrine, which illustrates many of the advantages of this approach. And finally, I will describe our broader experience with Enabled First in Human and use some short case studies to illustrate some key different configurations. We'll end with an opportunity for questions. So, starting with the state of the industry, it's well publicized that the number of compounds in development has increased. R&D spend has increased, and yet the average number of drugs approved has decreased. The challenge to industry, then, is to establish why this is the case, and to modify work streams, processes, and procedures accordingly in order to increase efficiency. This slide here depicts um, a publication from earlier this year by Hay and colleagues. The aim of the analysis that was performed was to assess success rates at each stage of the development pathway. So the team assessed data captured in the Biomed Tracker database and monitored the phase transition for almost 4,500 drugs for both their lead and their secondary indications. The results um, of part of the analysis are depicted in this graph, and they illustrate that the probability of successful transition from phase 1 to phase 2 is 64% whilst from phase two to phase three is only 32%. Taking both these figures into account, this translates into the failure of approximately 80% of drug candidates by the end of phase two. So the challenge is to work more efficiently and effectively in early development. And this has led to the emergence of a new R&D paradigm, the so-called quick win, fast fail concept. And in this concept, critical to success experimentation is introduced earlier in the development timeline in order to improve the identification of the 20% of molecules likely to exhibit successful proof of concept, and of course, to exclude that 80% of molecules that will not make it through to product launch. Interestingly, Hay and colleagues also provided a number of recommendations into how this might be done, including improvements in basic science, and also with communication with regulators, greater flexibility in protocols and the use of adaptive clinical trial designs, improvement in the identification and the use of biomarkers, and the use of targeted delivery formulations for improved delivery. One of the challenges that we face, however, in implementing this is the configuration of the industry. This diagram on this slide represents how the industry has configured itself in order to design, develop, and deliver drug products in the clinic and to generate data on those products. On the left-hand side, we have organizations with expertise in making. So this is the manufacture of the API, development of products, packaging and shipping of those products, either for clinical trials or post-approval. And then on the right-hand side are all the organizations with the testing know-how. These are the labs that perform preclinical and clinical testing upon receipt of the test product. The challenge that we face is how to get from the left to the right in a time and cost efficient manner and in, in a way that allows the implementation of the new paradigm. In other words, the requirement for increased flexibility and the ability to respond to data and work in a smarter way. Looking at the drawbacks of this um, conventional approach in a little bit more detail, the first is extended lead times for drug product supply. So stability data need to be generated to support a long shelf life purely because of the time taken for the transition from the manufacturer through to the packaging and labeling site and then on to the clinical site. 
the stability data, of course, takes time and it takes money in order to generate it. Also, batch sizes are generally far larger than are actually required, resulting in the unnecessary use and associated cost of API. Just um, out of interest, the photograph on the right on this slide is an example of drug, drug product that we were asked to incinerate at the end of a successful phase one study. So there's about 5,500 units of product here which were simply in excess of what was required in order to complete that phase one study. And because the aim is to get first subject first dose as quickly as possible, investment in pharmaceutical development is often initiated before pivotal toxicology has read out. Now the challenge with this is then that um, we have a single drug product and dose strengths, um, in particular starting dose, have to be estimated. And we're certainly aware of circumstances in which a first in human trial has had to be delayed as a result of starting dose calculations requiring a lower dose than was actually manufactured during the pharmaceutical development and clinical trial manufacturing. Um, formulation composition also has to be selected and selected again whilst perhaps not the full data package are available in order to support that decision. Given the scale of the manufacturing operation, there's limited opportunity to manufacture a variety of formulations, um, which might be of interest in terms of assessing which is the best formulation to take through first in human and into proof of concept. Of course, commonly first in human studies are actually performed with a solution or a suspension. And this is often fit for purpose for the first in human study. It provides an excellent way of getting solubilized drug into the body to get the pharmacokinetic profile and assess the safety and tolerability. Thank <laughs> you.